Good morning, this is Mr. Linares. It is the 3rd of November, 2020, and I'm going to talk to you today about introduction to diagnostic processes as far as automotive is concerned. Um, and as I go on through this, uh, just please keep in mind I'm using a Zoom recording here. Um, so if you end up hearing, uh, you know, cats and children and spouses and what have you in the, the background, uh, please uh, be a little forgiving because this is not a um, a sound secure environment, all right? Okay, so as far as talking about diagnostic processes go, and we're introducing you to the whole scheme here, um, I want to point out that the diagnostic thought process applies not only to automobiles, but just about anything you want to get into, okay? And as far as, um, if you see me looking down, I'm looking at the notes and I'm trying to hopefully keep eye contact when I can, okay? Um, it's, it's ho the whole point of diagnoses is to find the root cause of failure or a cause for what's happening. Um, failure being a subjective term. I mean, in the automotive industry, failure means something broke and that, that's that. In a school setting, failure means you simply didn't make the grade. It doesn't make, it, make that a, a, a quality statement on the person though. However, in the automotive industry, when we say failure, we, it's a negative connotation, something is not working, and that's that. So as far as we're concerned here, we're talking about the machine, um, automotive in particular, but it does apply to just about anything that works. Um, and uh, towards the end, I will talk a little bit about how it uh, does marry up into the real world a little bit, uh, especially considering, you know, the way things are these days, be a good idea to understand um, how a clear mode of thought will will help you out. Okay, so first thing we worried about when we're talking about introdu um, introducing diagnostic thought processes is your goal about the diagnostic. Okay, in uh, all things great and small, usually a diagnostic is to find a problem or a reason something happened. In the automotive industry, we call it the root cause of failure. This means the smallest item, the smallest chunk, the smallest part, the smallest thing that we can rationalize causing a fault or a series of faults, whether it be a very simple failure where something broke and then something is leaking or not working, or whether or not something broke, maybe it's leaking and it has a cascade effect, two, three, 10, 12 steps, however far it goes, whether or not it's going between two different systems, whatever it might be, okay? The root cause of failure is the most important to find when you're looking to solve a person's concern with their car. Customer is gonna come in with a symptom and you don't wanna fix the symptom, you wanna fix the cause behind the symptom, otherwise they're gonna keep coming back. And um, sometimes customers are forgiving and they'll accept it. Oh, hey, we make mistakes or maybe we missed a little something. <clears throat> but usually, when people are spending all the money that they do on a car, they want this to be right the first time, okay? So, as we're looking for the root cause of failure, you have to keep in mind, it's going to require the knowledge of systems interactions. Notice I put the apostrophe after, multiple systems here, okay? Knowledge of systems, interactions, and functions. It's going to require knowledge of components and their function. Well, plural functions. Okay. The whole thing here, the root cause of failure, requiring all the knowledge of how a system or systems function and interact with each other, as well as all, as all their constituent parts and their functions that contribute to this great whole. Okay. It's in order to find the why behind the why, oops, I need a why there, 
And just like in math class, let's just go and do that because it's going to go off into infinity. Okay. Why behind the why behind the why behind the why behind the why until you get to a rational start, a stopping point. In the automotive uh, industry, this is a part of a car. Okay. Yes, it is very true that there is a human condition, a human fault, a human error, human neglect, uh, human disregard, whatever you might want to call it, behind a part failing because we make the parts. However, trying to get that deep in an automotive shop is not practical and I have yet to see it happen. The only time you really get that far is when there's a major recall, um, you know, death, something like that from an accident where they'll get into who's responsible and they're looking for a human being. Again, that's still not the mechanic that usually gets involved unless there's some level of expert witness or something. And even then, they're still just offering a technical opinion. They're not talking about the material quality of something that was made or who was manufacturing, or what materials where they came from, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so when we look for the why behind the why, we are looking for a part. Okay. It's that simple. We are looking for a part that failed. Okay. Now, um, generally speaking, it's going to be the smallest part. And when I don't mean physically smallest, I mean in terms of its scope in its system. That means, um, let's say the uh, starter motor is not working and it's what's at fault. The engine, the engine does not crank effectively. The engine, uh, um, sometimes it will crank, sometimes it makes a horrible grinding sound. Um, and you come to find out that the drive gear is not functioning on the starter motor. Okay. You thought it was a ring gear, but it turned out to be the starter motor after you run your diagnostics and went through all the pathways for it. And you realize, well, Hey, maybe I could replace this little drive gear on the starter and call it a day and get this car back on the road. We don't replace those parts and starters anymore. So now the starter, even though it's made of you know three or four dozen parts, you don't do that anymore. The starter itself would be the smallest part. In uh, in contrast, maybe you'll see an O-ring causing a leak, you know, from a sensor or something like that, and it's dribbling fluid for whatever the sensor's for, and that O-ring is the uh, the fault part. And you can go to the your box of O-rings and replace the O-ring and put it back in. And everything would be fine. That would be the uh, fault part, the root cause of failure right there. Okay, and we'll get into describing how the faults are, are, are listed and, and labeled and all that. You know, what, what, uh, what um, wording we use to describe the faults here in a little bit. Okay, so in the process of looking for the root cause of failure, again, applying the knowledge of the systems and the functions and the parts that make up the system, looking for the why behind the why behind the why on and on till you get to your small part. There's a little, um, there's a little, uh, a little rationale that we use in the auto industry, and there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Some people say the three C's, some people say the five C's. Uh, you know, different manufacturers have different ways of doing it. I like Ford's uh, idea, and I, I believe other manufacturers use it, and we call it the three C's. Okay, the three C's are concern. Cause, oops, uh, oh, love whiteboard thinks it's trying to draw a circle. Concern, cause, and correction. Now, when it comes down to it, the concern, what is what went wrong? The cause is the root cause of failure component. Okay, now understand the root cause component. That doesn't mean you're only going to be replacing one part. Sometimes you've got three or four, 10 things to replace because something really, really bad happened or some major assembly. Okay, but you're going to be looking for that root cause of failure. Okay, root cause of failure, RCOF. I'll be using that. If I write this out anymore, I'll just put that there because uh, writing it out, just, I have messy writing and it takes too long and I'm lazy. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> Um, I'm kidding. I'm not lazy most days. All right. And then correction is how the fault was corrected. Okay. Or repaired. 
All right, so those are the three C's right there. This is how you find the why behind the why, all right? Now, uh, let's just uh, use a little example here um, before we uh, actually, yeah, we'll go ahead and do this now, okay? Check this out. Let's see, hopefully it's still on my, my uh, paster here. We have a little story here that I wrote and is extraordinarily simple and very, very generic, okay? And not, uh, not you know, uh, as far as writing for legal purposes, what I would call the best best, but, um, you know, it was pulled out of my head uh, without having seen the vehicle. So I'm just trying to imagine something generic and very basic here, okay? And this is just an example. And this whole thing can apply to just about any way you would um, talk about concern, cause, and correction, okay? <clears throat> for example, say you have a car that is pulling right, okay? Customer states the car is pulling right. So technician verifies the concern, the vehicle does pull to the right, and no other steering concerns is noted or noted. So that means that the, the car is driving down the road, okay? The technician has his hand on the steering wheels, and he goes ahead and he lets go, okay, a little bit. You know, it gives that steering wheel a little bit of float, but doesn't really let go because it's dumb to do when you're driving, right? And the car starts to go ahead and creep on over. Creep, 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 okay? Not wanted while you're driving, okay? So he says, yes, it indeed pulls to the right. Technician moves the vehicle back to the shop. Inspection of the suspension system. Uh, oh, I misspelled system, T-E-M, sorry. Inspection of the suspension and steering system, let's see if I can fix that there, shows that the right upper control arm bushings are split and the lower ball joint is loose, okay? These faults must be resolved and system retested in order to restore normal operation, all right? Now, this statement right here is a proposal to correct it, okay? Technician believes if we fix these things, we're going to correct the pull condition. Okay, and then uh, of course the customer's got to get an authorization going for your repairs. Repairs are authorized by the customer. Replace both right upper control arm bushings and right front lower ball joint, all right? Okay, so right here was our correction. The vehicle was aligned, then test driven, all right? Because there's adjustments that needed to be made to all those components um, in terms of making the vehicle tr uh, track straight again on the road and then have to verify you did a good job because you did not correct a job, okay? You did not repair anything until you made sure you repaired it, okay? And, and uh, giving it a solid effort to uh, double check your work. Vehicle tracks normally over a 10 mile drive in town. So you tell the customer, hey, this is what we did in our di uh, and during the whole diagnostic process that's going on, the very tail end of that diagnostic process and on the repair process that followed it um, tells you what we did to make sure everything was groovy. Okay, and the fail parts have material failure due to age and wear. Now, normally you would list all these things part by part, had material failure, had this kind of failure, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now let's get into the next thing about the diagnosis when we're talking about it, when we're describing things, okay. Oops, I'm sorry, I have my little, my little cheat sheet down here I gotta look at so I don't uh, go wandering off onto some tangent. Okay, so while we've organized the three C's, we've go ahead and we put it into a store. We're talking about what's going on and we're finishing our diagnosis and our repair, okay? And as far as I'm concerned, when you're talking about diagnosis and you come out with the proposal of what's wrong, your diagnosis cannot be complete until you've com finished a repair simply because you have not resolved the issues you found wrong to prove out what you what you have um, what you've done. Okay, you haven't proved it out yet. So unless you've proved it out and you proved you're correct, you can't call your diagnosis correct. Okay, so finishing the repair and everything completes this process. Is why I've been mentioning this so far. Okay, so when you're talking about what failed and how it failed, you want to use certain terminology here. Okay, so we'll say, oops, I'd rather use a different color than this. Let's go back to my magic crayon here. You have the types of failure. Okay, now the first one is you have a material failure. 
okay? This is the part material simply failed all by itself due to age and wear typically, okay? Or some level of structural um, fragility or something like that, all right? This means that nobody caused it, nobody neglected it, nobody did anything to it, and through normal use, it failed, okay? Um, this is the simplest kind of failure, and it's just stuff happens, okay? And again, this is where it goes back to that first thing I was talking about. Yes, we know there's a human error behind all of this somewhere, but behind that parts failure, the time investment and monetary investment to go find out how it really, really failed just does not happen in the auto industry. Not unless there's some kind of grievous recall or uh, death or something along those lines, okay? The next kind of failure mode that we have is neglect slash human error. This one's kind of self-explanatory here. Somebody didn't take care of a problem when it was happening. Somebody didn't take care of the car like they should for preventive maintenance. Or somebody, while they were caring for the car, while they were driving the car, while they were working on the car, perhaps, okay, committed some kind of accident, all right? They, did, they didn't intend to harm the vehicle, but it happened through uh, an, an, uh, an, uh, an erratic action. Like um, say somebody's working on the, the front of the car and they're putting, um, they're putting a new grill on or something like that. And after they have it all out, they're cleaning up an area behind the, the front grill where they're gonna replace it and they accidentally slip and screwdriver goes through the air conditioning com condenser, pokes a big hole in it, refrigerant pukes out of it, and now they have to replace this condenser. That would be human error. That would not be a material failure, okay? Uh, in terms of it just broke, it means somebody did something to that. Now that human error, you could also circle back to neglect if you want, because if somebody wasn't set up properly and they're standing so they're stable and they didn't have a good control of their tool, they were neglecting that kind of thing. But again, that gets into a whole bunch of value and judgment statements that we don't typically get into. <clears throat> when we say neglect, we mean genuine, I don't care neglect. On the other side of that, we have human error, where it's just a, a bona fide mistake. Somebody was trying their best, and even if their best effort didn't work, something bad still happened, okay? Lastly, we have external influence damage. I don't know why this computer keeps doing this, sorry. External influence damage is when something from the outside of the vehicle, outside the part, outside influence, comes and affects the vehicle. This means that um, it, uh, it could fall into the realm of human error and neglect, um, but typically it would be called accident, weather, flying objects, things, things along, those, uh, along those lines, okay? Um, so an example for external influence damage would be your windshield, okay? Um, if you had a material failure in windshield, you're driving along and a little crack starts to show up because maybe the car flexes a little bit and it starts to crack, but nothing hit that wind, windshield to actually make it break. Um, that would be a material failure of the windshield. Okay, didn't hold up to its stresses normally, et cetera, et cetera. External influence damage would be a rock flying off of a truck or something like that, landing on the window and then cracking it, causing it to spider out and then um, causing damage to the windshield or like say a radiator. Material failure would be that it's leaking out of its drain valve, okay? Drain valve's closed and the seal for the drain valve is, is, is ruptured and now it's um, leaking coolant, that would be a material failure. External influence damage would be somebody was careless while they were working on the suspension system, swung a hammer and then knocked the drain valve off causing the damage to the radiator. <clears throat> okay, so that's... Um, that's like pretty much your intro to getting ready to think about the diagnostic thought process. The why behind the why. So what I'm going to do here, there's uh, two, uh, two little areas I'm going to work with on you to show you what a trouble tree looks like. And then um, how to order the, the uh, thought processes a little bit 
uh, before we uh, go ahead and call this a video here, okay? So I've pulled up on all data. Let me shrink this down here. Um, a, a, a Ford truck, and it's an ex expedition, and uh, engine overheats, okay? And what Ford has provided various, uh, various people and uh, shops and what have you is access to their information. This thing that you see right here, this uh, trouble tree is the actual Ford trouble tree that they uh, show you, okay? And it's not spread out like a tree. We just call it that. It just follows the uh, choose your own adventure kind of pattern for solving problems, except this one, you have to actually answer questions as you go along. Okay, it gives you a friendly little, uh, first off it says we have an engine overheat issue. First thing says check the engine coolant level, make sure it's not hot. Gives you a warning about opening a hot cooling system and then asks, hey, is the engine coolant okay? Well, yes, if it is, then you go to B2, check the condition of the coolant, you know, and the answer is yes or no, okay? If it was no, then you're gonna end up flushing the system, retest the system for operation because you need good coolant to prevent overheat. However, if you looked at the engine coolant and you say, no, it is not at a good level. Well, it says refill it and then go back to uh, the, the uh, a previous pinpoint test for, to, to check out for faults, okay? You have checking for airflow obstruction, check for heater core operation, check the thermostat, answering yes and no questions as you carry along. More about checking the thermostat. Check the cooling fan operation to see if it's working. Okay, now in here, it isn't, one thing I noticed that it did not mention, it did not mention water pump function, which you would wanna check, okay? And that's one of those things that's so screaming obvious they didn't, they don't put it in here because you would notice mechanically if that was really bad, okay? But it takes you in, um, takes you in a path, left and right, yes and no, to solve these problems in a logical process from where's your symptom at, what are the things that you have to look at, what parts are involved, and you have to have an understanding of how these things involve, because when it says inspect this or test that, you have to have some kind of working knowledge of what you're doing, okay? Now, these, these kind of processes here are designed for the novice technician to go through and still be a success at fixing a car. Um, but unfortunately, and this is why I'm actually even making the video, too often people don't sit down, knuckle down and think about all the factors possible in solving a problem. They want to just get it over with and be done. And um, that's not going to be very helpful in many areas, especially if you're a technician, if you don't have the patience to sit and do this considerate uh, thought process because you may find yourself making bad repairs, making the wrong repair, okay, or not repairing enough sometimes, okay? So um, finding out what those root causes of failure is, is very, very critical to being a decent tech. And then um, also, if you want to get so deep about thinking about things like this, you can take it off into your life. And if you start considering the why behind the why, and, how things work with whatever problem you're having, you're gonna find yourself being a much more considerate and eventually, ho hopefully, happier individual because you know how things function and work. And this could be society, it could be what you're thinking about politics, what you're thinking about um, you know, your, your feelings or how traffic works or what about your TV set, you, you never know. It could be a million different things. Um, and uh, sometimes people don't even care to solve one problem or another. It is just not their, their, their cup of tea, but knowing how to solve a problem when it does become important to you is very, very um, beneficial, okay? That way you, you can get more of the things done your way, the way you want, how you want, and in turn be able to serve others well, um, if you so choose, at a minimum, take care of yourself without having to worry about relying on other people's information um, and, and how good they've done all this, okay, when you have chosen not to, or it maybe it's not even your job to do, all right? So if you have any questions, you can either get a hold of me through the uh, email or through uh, Remind, and um, well, hope you have a good day, and I'll see you later. Take it easy.